Hi and welcome to our September ACNC webinar. Today's session focuses on some of the key information new charity board members should be armed with as they take their place on a charities board, as well as some of the things they should be aware of when stepping into their role. My name is Chris Richards and I'm from the ACNC's education team. With me is my colleague April Kitchener. Hey April. Hi Chris, hi everyone. Today we'll co cover a number of topics. We will provide five quick questions new charity board members should ask give a brief introduction to the ACNC, who we are and what we do, look at charities' ongoing obligations to the ACNC and the ACNC's governance standards, examine in detail key duties for responsible persons, including charity board members, and provide some other general tips for those new to the board. Now, before we start, to those of you joining us today who have decided to jump in and join a charity board, we'd like to say two things. Congratulations and thank you. So many of Australia's nearly 55,000 registered charities rely on the contributions of people like you. Board members who are willingly giving up their time, often without remuneration, to help an organisation they support. Without volunteers and volunteer board members, many charities would struggle to be as effective as they are. Some may even cease to exist. So we at the ACNC want to acknowledge all those great, engaged and involved charity board members including the new ones. When you join a board, there's a few quick questions you should ask right at the start. We've listed five here on the screen, and some of these you've most likely already covered as you've prepared to jump onto a charity board. None of them are formal ACNC requirements per se, but they are important in terms of ensuring good governance and a high functioning board. And of course, every charity is different, so there might be some extra questions you'll need to ask. The ones we've listed are, ensure you, ensure you clarify your role, uh, that you're clear on your role and what your responsibilities will be. A position or role description is handy here. Have you, uh, have you got your induction pack? A properly inducted board member is a quickly productive board member. So if you haven't received an induction pack, talk to your charity about ensuring you have the information and documentation you need in order to hit the ground running in your new role. Third one is a handover. If, you're if you are taking over a specific board role, organising time with your predecessor to sit down and discuss the ins and outs of that role is a great idea. Adequate and documented handover processes are vital. The fourth point is meetings. It might sound basic, but confirm when, where and how often meetings will be staged, as well as how you will receive meeting agendas and minutes. The last point is looking at the duties, of the duties to the ACNC. A rundown of your charity's duties to the ACNC should be part of your charity's induction process or welcome pack, and all board members should be clear on them. We'll cover elements of these points in more detail throughout the webinar, but right now we'll take a quick look at who the ACNC is and what it does. So the ACNC is the Independent National Regulator of Charities. Essentially, we have five functions. We register charities. We maintain an online database of registered charities called the Charity Register. And this register is freely available, searchable and used by the public, donors, volunteers, grant makers and government. We also provide advice, guidance and education to charities on their obligations to the ACNC. We monitor the compliance of charities with their requirements of being registered, such as meeting the governance standards and lodging an annual information statement. We respond to concerns raised about charities by the public and other government agencies. And finally, we have, we have a responsibility in all of our work to try and reduce red tape for charities. By ensuring our processes are as streamlined as possible and by working with other agencies to try and harmonize, harmonize reporting requirements. To learn more about the ACNC and its work, uh, visit the link on your screen there, acnc.gov.au, about ACNC. Just on that last point, we have a handy guide up on the ACNC website, which can help provide a solid introduction or refresher on the duties charities have to us. The guide is called My Charity and the ACNC, and it provides an overview of the ACNC's functions, as well as information on things like charity reporting obligations. Things like that are important for new board members to know. It also contains a number of handy links and reference points to accessing your charity's records on the ACNC Charity Register, as well as other useful checklists to refer to. Again, visit the web address on your screen to download it. 
If you do download and read My Charity and the ACNC, you'll see mention made of responsible persons. Responsible persons is a term that ACNC uses to describe those people who have ultimate responsibility for how the charity is run and who vote on decisions. You're probably more familiar with them as your board or committee members, your directors or your trustees. It's this group of individuals who together are ultimately responsible for overseeing the charity's operations and making sure it's working towards achieving its charitable purpose. It's worth noting that responsible persons may employ staff to carry out some of the day-to-day -day tasks of a charity, and if that occurs, the staff are responsible to, and, will, and would report to, the organisation's responsible persons. We do have a useful fact sheet on responsible persons, and that's available at acnc.gov.au forward slash responsible persons. My charity in the ACNC provides a useful reference point for new charity board members when it comes to understanding their charity's obligations to the ACNC. Charities which are registered with the ACNC must meet five ongoing obligations. They must keep their charity status. To remain eligible to be registered, charities must continue to be not-for-profit and pursue their charitable purposes, purpose or purposes. Uh, they must keep records. That includes correct and accurate financial records and statements. They must report annually, but that, that occurs by submitting the annual information statement and for medium and large charities, a financial report, and that has to happen every year. They have to notify the ACNC of changes. This might include changes to the charity's legal name, its address for service, governing documents and responsible persons. And the last, the last obligation is to meet governance standards. That's a set of standards that charities must meet to be registered and remain registered with the ACNC. Those who are running a registered charity need to ensure their organisation complies with these obligations. And again, there's a website up there on the screen to help you, uh, to provide you with a reference point to help you out. As Chris mentioned, one of the ongoing obligations of registered charities is meeting the ACNC's governance standards. The governance standards are a set of five minimum standards which deal with how a charity is run. This includes a charity's process, activities, governance and compliance. Under the governance standards, charities are required to demonstrate their not-for-profit purpose and character and that it works towards its charitable purposes and provides information about its purposes to the public. It must take reasonable steps to be accountable to its members and provide them with adequate opportunities to raise concerns about how the charity is governed. It must not commit a serious offence such as fraud under Australian law or breach a law that may result in a penalty of 60 penalty units or more. And it must take reasonable steps to ensure its responsible persons are not disqualified from managing a corporation or disqualified from being a responsible person of a registered charity. And finally, the fifth standard covers the duties of responsible persons, including board members. For new charity board members, familiarity with these seven duties is a must, and we'll cover them in detail through the next few slides. More on these standards can be found on our website at forward slash governance standards, as well as in our governance for good publication, which is at forward slash governance for good. The seven duties set down in governance standard five uh, di uh, direct a charity's responsible persons to. Uh, one, act with reasonable care and diligence to act honestly and fairly in the best interests of the charity and for its charitable purposes, to not misuse their position as a responsible person, to not misuse information they gain in their position as a responsible person, to disclose conflicts of interest, to ensure the charity's financial affairs are managed responsibly, and to not allow the charity to operate while insolvent. As a new charity board member, these seven duties provide you with a firm starting point to guide your actions and behaviour when carrying out your duties. And any charity registered with the ACNC must take reasonable steps to ensure that the people running the organisation know and understand these duties and comply with them. We'll now explain each of these duties in more detail and what you can do to comply with these standards. The first duty is for charity board members to act with reasonable care and diligence. As a charity board member, you'll be tasked with fulfilling a number of different duties. This is a significant responsibility, not only to the charity, its members and those it works with, but to the wider community as well. This first duty reinforces this responsibility and the importance of exercising care and diligence in your roles. It involves playing an active role in guiding and monitoring the charity's development and management and being aware of your obligations. You also need to stay informed about the charity 
such as its work, its finances and the state it's in. And being informed isn't just knowing about or being aware of these things, it's crucial that you also understand them. For example, if a responsible person receives key financial information about their charity, it's not enough to just read or look, up, look over the figures. There needs to be a level of understanding that goes along with that. As a general point, you need to be an informed and engaged board member. Other ways to comply with this standard are to read any board papers, um, ensure you're appropriately informed about any matter on which you need to make a decision, and attend board meetings on a regular basis. Be aware that missing several board meetings in a row without a compelling reason to do so might be seen as a breach of this duty. It's also important to remember that you can always ask for help or seek the knowledge of a, of a professional or even the expertise of another responsible person like the treasurer when dealing with the charity's financial reports. But you should always carefully consider any advice you are given and ask questions to ensure that you understand it. If you're in a position of responsibility at a charity, your first priority must be to the charity. Decisions that you make must be made from the viewpoint of the charity's best interests and what would further its work and charitable purposes. These charitable purposes are often set out in an organisation's governing documents. We'll speak more about governing documents later in the webinar. But any personal interests, interests of other, or interests of other organisations need to be set aside. When you're acting in your role as a charity board member, you need to step into your charity board member headspace and view your actions from the perspective of what would be best for the charity in this situation. When making a decision at a board meeting, for example, be diligent. Don't just follow the crowd. You should always do what you think is best for the charity, even if it sometimes means taking a different viewpoint to other board members. Your duty as a responsible person of a charity is to do the best you can on its behalf, to guide and to shepherd it so it can be the best it can be. Duty number three is to not misuse your position as a responsible person, which is linked to duty number two. Part of acting in a charity's best interest as a board member is to ensure you don't misuse your position as a responsible person. Any actions which clearly, clearly run counter to duty number three are a misuse of your position of responsibility. An example of a breach of this duty would be when someone running a charity uses their position to pay a company owned by friends or relatives when there really is no reason to make such a payment. No goods or services have been provided to the charity, for example. Your role as a charity board member isn't about providing benefits to yourself or others. It's to ensure that the charity is doing the best it can to further its purposes and assist its beneficiaries. Misusing your position in this way will not only result in a breach of the ACNC's governance standards, but it can lead to other serious or even criminal charges being laid. As a charity board member, you'll most likely be privy to a range of information, some of which may be sensitive or even confidential. Any responsible person has a duty that sensitive or confidential information relating to the charity and its operations they help run remains in-house and is not misused. And the definition of sensitive information is most likely wider than what, than that, than, uh, what many new charity board members would initially think. This type of information doesn't just cover the obvious stuff, financial information, contracts, tendering, project management, or personnel issues. It can also cover information about your charity's operations, its future direction, what happened at last Tuesday's board meeting even. All of this information should be handled with discretion and respect. Sensitive charity information can carry as much value as money. It needs to be used properly. Not doing so can put your charity at risk or damage its reputation. Board members need to become skilled at partitioning their role with their charity or separating it from, their, from the rest of their everyday life. Doing so helps guide against any conflicts of interest. After all, there's always a crossover between different parts of our lives. For example, crossovers between the personal and professional or work parts of our lives. But anyone who serves as a responsible person for a charity needs to take care that the intertwined parts of their lives don't improperly impact on the charity they serve. Now, for a charity's responsible persons, having a conflict of interest doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing. The key is how they are managed. As part of their duties, responsible persons should properly address any actual or perceived conflicts of interest. This means a clear and open disclosure of any conflict between their duty to act for the charity and their personal or private interest, as well as making sure they are not part of any discussion or decision making, matter, making on a matter where there is such a conflict. You can remove yourself from the room when, they dis when these discussions take place, for example. 
You should also ensure that your charity has a policy of con on conflicts of interests and even maintains a register of interests. Importantly, this type of approach should also be followed even if the conflict of interest is perceived rather than actual. A conflict should be disclosed whenever an independent observer could doubt that a responsible person is acting in the best interest, interests of the charity. For new charity board members, it's a good idea to find out whether your charity holds a register of interests document in which board members can publicly disclose their interests to ensure transparency and good governance. So the ACNC has a great guide on managing conflicts of interest, which can be downloaded via the link on your screen. Of course, financial management is an important component of charity board members' duties. But for new charity board members, or those considering jumping onto the board, the ACNC's emphasis is clear. You don't have to be a financial genius to be on a charity board, but you do need to be aware of and willing to ask questions about your charity's, financial, your charity's finances, and you should be able to at least grasp the basics of a financial statement. It is perfectly reasonable, even acceptable, for charity board members to ask questions of their treasurer or financial officer if they are not sure about something. In fact, it should be encouraged. Ultimately, a good approach when considering financial matters is to consider how any decision you make could impact on the charity's financial health. Charities should also have processes in place to manage their money responsibly and to protect themselves against financial mismanagement or fraud. A key part of any board member's efforts to ensure effective and proper financial management in their organisation is the duty to not allow a charity to operate while insolvent. Insolvency is when an organisation cannot pay all of its debts when they fall due. If a responsible person reasonably, reasonably suspects that the charity cannot pay all of its debts when they become due, then the responsible person should take all reasonable steps to prevent a charity from taking on more debt. In addition, a charity's board should regularly review its financial position and ensure there is enough money to pay for its activities. The last seven or eight slides have covered the duties that charity board members, responsible persons, have to the ACNC. But there are a number of other general good governance tips new charity board members should take note of. And when we speak about governance, we refer to the actions a charity and its responsible persons take to ensure that it is effectively and properly run. So we have already touched on this, but we do recommend that new charity board members ask after and actively seek out an induction pack or welcome pack to prepare them for their new role. An induction pack should include information about your charity's obligations to the ACNC and any other regulator. Um, you'll also include your charity's governing documents, its annual and financial reports, and information which allows you to access key charity information um, or accounts, or even the organisation's listing on the charity register. It can also include step-by-step -step uh, step -step descriptions covering key charity processes, like registering new board members. And if you're taking over a specific board role from someone else, pursue a coordinated handover um, with that person where you can chat um, about their role and what it requires. We've also already touched on charity governing documents, but it is important for responsible persons to ensure that they are familiar with what these documents say and contain. Generally, governing documents are formal document, documents which set out the charity's charitable purpose or purposes, that is what it does, who it works with or helps, that the charity operates on a not-for-profit basis, and the way that the charity's board or committee makes decisions and consults with members. New board members should seek out their charity's governing document and familiarise themselves with it. And once you do so, don't just stash this document away somewhere to gather dust. Ensure it is regularly updated and it is a living, breathing and relevant document. Remember, the ACNC needs to be notified of any changes you make to your governing documents, as well as receiving a copy of the changed documents. You can read more in our fact sheet and that's forward slash governing document. Meetings are a prime example of good governance practice by ensuring your members are kept informed about your charity's activities. Each charity will organise and run board committee or sub subcommittee meetings in subtly different ways, depending on all sorts of variables, like its work, stakeholders and partners, for example. There are even times of the year where meetings may have to be held more often to ensure things are still on track. A key component towards a well-run, productive meeting is a good agenda. 
Your agenda should include what is, to be, what is to be discussed at the meeting and the likely time for each item, who is responsible for leading the discussion on each item, and the purpose of the item being discussed. Does, does a decision need to be made or does it need to just be noted? Is it just for information? Is advice being sought or is the matter for discussion only? Taking time to prepare a good agenda will help ensure you invite the right people to the meeting to provide information or advice and that any support material for items on the agenda is prepared and board members are well, well informed in advance. There's a couple links to resources on holding meetings and agendas on the ACNC website and there are also a number of great resources from other organisations like the Justice, uh, sorry, like Governance Institute, Justice Connect or our community. Annual general meetings represent another important good governance practice. An AGM basically sees organisations present a report to their members about how it is travelling financially and what it's been up to over the past 12 months. A charity might use its AGM to make changes to its governing documents or even its name. In addition, most groups also have their board elections at their AGM, meaning a charity's responsible persons may change at this time. Those running a charity need to be aware that if they use their AGM to change their legal name, alter its governing documents or change its responsible persons, the ACNC must be notified. And that's all done through the ACNC charity portal with your username and password, which you should all have, but if you don't, you can reset it online or give us a call and we can help you. There's no specific requirement under the ACNC's legislation to hold an AGM. However, doing so might be a good way for your charity to demonstrate that it is accountable to its members under Governance Standard 2. There is also no requirement for charities to advise the, the ACNC of the date of your AGM or register your upcoming AGM with the ACNC. However, you will still need to follow any requirements around holding an AGM as set out in your governing documents, model rules or articles of association. Charities might have a number of obligations to other Commonwealth, state or territory agencies about around the staging of an AGM. That might be due to your legal structure, for example. If that's the case, be aware of these requirements and continue to follow them if applicable. Duty number six, which we covered earlier in the webinar, webinar looks at how charity board members need to ensure their organisation's financial affairs are managed responsibly. This type of responsible financial management stretches the need for responsible persons to ensure their charity can not only gather the resources required for the organisation to do its work, but safeguards those resources and ensures they are, insu they are used in an efficient and lawful way. This covers issues like reserves, budgeting, spending and other elements of financial management. As we mentioned earlier, board and committee members should have enough financial knowledge to be able to make informed decisions on the charity's finances. This might mean your charity's responsible persons undergo some financial literacy training. There are plenty of courses around. In addition, the ACNC's guide on managing charity money can be found um, at the link on your website, uh, that, on the link on the screen that you see there. It is important that those running a charity know what their record keeping obligations are and who it needs to report to. ACNC record keeping obligations include your charity keeping certain written financial and operational records and there are examples of each of those up on your screen right now. You can keep the records in any format you choose as long as they are easy to find and that includes in electronic form and you can develop your own system or process to keep these records as well. You have to keep the records for seven years and you have to keep the records in English or in a form that can be easily translated into English. However, your charity does not have to provide records to the ACNC unless asked. Keeping proper records can help your charity show it is continuing to be run as a not-for-profit and working towards its charitable purposes. It can help, it understand, help understand whether your charity is in good financial health, assess whether the right kinds of decisions are being made, both operational and financial, communicate about your charity's activities and finances, prepare reports to meet your reporting obligations to the ACNC other government regulators, donors, funders and members and otherwise show that your charity meets its obligations under the ACNC Act, tax and other relevant laws. The ACNC's resource on keeping charity records can be found there, the link on your screen. We also have a record keeping checklist that can be found at ACNC forward slash record keeping checklist. Most charities and charity board members will experience a difference of opinion or internal dispute at some stage. Some dispute, disputes can be across the board table between volunteers, staff members or others. 
Now, not everyone has to get along like best mates. There are all manner of uh, personalities which coexist inside charities. However, what is important to remember is that the work of the charity, its charitable purpose, is paramount. People can coexist and perhaps not get along all the time, but once this starts to impact on the charity as a whole or puts the charity at risk of breaching the ACNC Act, then the situation isn't good enough. It's a good idea to set in place some policies on how to handle disputes, how to arbitrate them, as well as dispute resolution procedures and techniques. Those running a charity should be familiar with any procedures but they should be also be prepared to intervene where required or refer things onwards to other authorities. Finally, don't run into trouble with relating, um, related issues like bullying or harassment. This can see a charity hit legal trouble and its reputation take a hit too. The ACNC has a guide on dealing with internal disputes and we'll include the link in the follow-up email when we send out uh, very soon. While the ACNC is the charity regulator here in Australia, there are a number of other regulators at state, territory or Commonwealth level to whom your charity might have obligations. Right there on the screen, you'll see a list of some of those bodies. Charity board members should at least be aware that their organisation may have obligations to regulators who aren't the ACNC. For a more comprehensive rundown, visit the ACNC's other regulators page, again at that link at the bottom of the uh, slide right there, forward slash other regulators. We're nearing the end of our formal presentation today. Up on your screen there, we've got a list of useful links around the ACNC web website, which can help new charity board members with their responsibilities. Don't worry about madly um, writing them all down. Um, we'll send these links out in the follow-up email. Of course, what we've covered today isn't an all-encompassing list, though we have tried our best. Um, but it is a good starting point for new charity board members um, to be, re be aware of a few things that might come up. Many new board members might find themselves at charities with their own unique and individual requirements. If this is the case, being aware of general good governance practices and having access to useful resources can be a big help. Having a solid foundation of knowledge, policy procedures, and an awareness of your responsibilities can go a long way towards helping new board members fulfill their roles successfully and in a way which helps uh, the charity achieve, achieve its aims. Well, that's about it from us today. Thank you, April, for coming along and helping out. Thanks again to everyone here for joining us. We'll see you another time. Thanks very much.